Hey, welcome to my tutorial. It's brought to you by Kalele. You can find us at kalele.io and you can learn about my IDDD workshop at kalele.io slash IDDD workshop. In this tutorial, I'm going to be addressing a topic that seems to confuse a lot of people. The topic is coupling and decoupling. What does it mean for software? Well, let's dive in. I thought it would be helpful to look at the definitions for these two concepts, coupling and to decouple. Coupling is a noun, which simply means the pairing of two items. Decouple means separate, disengage, or dissociate from something else. Well, these seem to be pretty simple definitions, should be easy to understand, but sometimes when it applies to software, it can mean just slightly a bit different things than exactly these two terms. So let's, it, let's look into what it means for software development. It should be obvious that when A, uses B in some way to perform some operation, A is coupled to B. But let's think about this in a different term. Some people would say that if we have this concept here, A to B, and A uses A to B, and A to B uses B, that A is now decoupled from B. But is that really the case? Actually, no. Well, as long as A to B actually does something with B and B performs some operation for A to B, A is still coupled to B. There's an indirection there, but the coupling still exists. Now, we might insist on some mental gymnastics here and try to prove to ourselves that A is actually completely decoupled from B. But think about it for a moment. If B provides some kind of information that is returned to A to B and then in turn is given to A, even if a complete translation of that information is performed here in A to B, if B were to change the information, it would change the way that A to B has to translate that. If A to B would always provide the same answer, no matter whether the logic within B would cause some kind of different outcome, then A to B actually isn't truly using B. So the coupling is right here. And even if the operation is not a query, but some kind of command, and B modifies its state in some way, and the value changes from one to two, for example, well, the system has changed, and A has caused a change to B by following this path of A to B down to B. So regardless, A is still coupled to B. Now think about this for a moment. What if we were to take this A to B and change it to the concept of a message bus? And let's say that A now sends an event to the message bus. And let's say that A doesn't even have to use the address of B, but there's some kind of a pub sub uh, topic here or exchange and all that A has to do is deliver the event, send the event to the message bus under a given topic name. And this topic name might even be all. So this is quite vanilla. It sounds like anybody could, as long as they have credentials, they could subscribe to all. In that case, A is decoupled from B. However, B is now dependent on A. Why? Because the message 
is going to be delivered, this event message is going to be delivered to B, and B will have to understand the event message. How does it understand the event message? Well, it's going to have to get some kind of information, a schema, or something like that, some kind of instructions on how to parse the information, and it's going to, when it parses this event so that it can read it, or deserialize it, or however you like to consider that, this event will cause B to now be coupled to A. There are some ways to smooth this out a bit, but they're still coupled now. B is now coupled to A. Now, I understand you might be thinking that B is not really coupled to A, but B is coupled to the event. True, but A owns the definition of the event. It decides what the schema is or what the format is and the information that it puts on it. So, this is almost like B now querying back to A, except B doesn't have to have a direct dependency on A, yet it still depends on the information that A provides. This is not as bad of a situation or as critical in terms of a dependency, a coupling, because if B were to depend on an API or some kind of uh, interface here to call back on in order to get information from A, then it would be a different kind of coupling, a stronger coupling. So this is a weaker kind of coupling, and yet it is still a coupling. We cannot say that B and A are completely decoupled here, not even with a message bus and a pub sub topic. Because this is a weak coupling, it's not a dire situation that B has some kind of dependency on the event defined by A. But let's change the dynamics here just a bit. Let's say that A and B are not in the same space, not in the same process space, but B is in a separate service, and this service is a ports, has a ports and adapters architecture. If you haven't seen my previous three videos on the ports and adapters architecture, I welcome you to return to those and see them. They're the first three in this series. Now, let's say that the event were to travel entirely into the inside of this service and B would become deeply dependent on the structure and information of this event. What would happen then? Well, that wouldn't be good. It would mean that any time that A would change the structure, the data types, or the data, or add any information to it, or take anything away from it, B would be subject to those situations, and it would be impacted by them. B would have to change. Whether or not those changes would be heavy, big, we don't know. But why not protect it up front? How would we do that? Before the event can actually be taken in to the interior of this service, what we're going to do is translate the event here into a command. The command will be a command that applies directly to this service. It is the way that this service will work well with this kind of information coming in. How does that translation occur? Well, you probably guessed it if you watched the Ports and Adapters series of tutorials. This adapter, or an adapter, would take the event, translate it to a command, and then in some way or another relay it to the inside. There's a different situation with messaging to consider though. What about direct point to point? Well, when a sender sends to a receiver using point to point messaging, the sender is coupled to the receiver's address. Let's look at this diagram. In this case, B must create a queue for itself. This queue has a name. You could say that it's an address. The address is something to do with the network location as well as the name of the queue. When A wants to send a command to B over its queue, it must attach to the message queue mechanism first and then send to the B queue. And when 
this message queue receives the command, it will then asynchronously deliver the command to B. Where is the coupling here? Well, the coupling is to the address. But also understand that the command is a coupling now. Why is the command a coupling? One side or the other has to define the command that will be sent. And hopefully the design is such that B designs the contract, declares the contract for the command that will be sent. This means now that A is not only coupled to the message queue and the messaging mechanism, but it's also coupled to the command that should be designed by B. Isn't there any kind of de decoupling here though? Well, again, B doesn't know the sender necessarily, so that's a decoupling. But there's also another decoupling to consider, the temporal decoupling. That means that time is decoupled because of the asynchrony of the message send. There is a detachment in time. A is not dependent on when B receives the message, and B is not dependent on when A sends the message. So there is a kind of decoupling between these two, but don't make the mistake in thinking that just because you are using asynchronous messaging that somehow either through a message buff with a topic or through a message queue that is asynchronous, both of these are asynchronous, there are still dependencies. There is only a temporal decoupling, but there will be dependencies either in the address and the messages being sent or simply the message type. Consider another example. Understand that if A is completely decoupled from B, nothing happens. A is fully dependent on its capabilities. B is fully dependent on its capabilities. And if there is no collaboration between these, if there is no collaboration between any, two components in the entire system, there is no system. Decoupling is a good thing, but only when it doesn't produce zero results. Coupling is absolutely necessary. Coupling should not be viewed as a bad thing. It's the certain kinds of coupling and not being careful about coupling that produces the strange results that usually bite us later on when we're not really aware of what's going on with the previous design and we try to make a change and we realize that there's a very strong coupling between two objects and that's what actually is going to cause problems. So remember, there's always a coupling with a message bus when a sender is going to send to the message bus and there is a coupling to the topic that it needs to send to, and the receiver will also be coupled to the message bus and the topic. The same goes for a message queue, that A will have to know how to send to B's message queue, and it can only do that if B creates that queue, and we know the name of that queue, and the location of the messaging mechanism. Further, what about a database or any kind of storage. There is going to be a coupling to databases. It's just the way it is. Or any kind of file system, the use of any kind of file system, a component is going to be coupled to that. If we don't have coupling to some kind of storage long-term long persistence, we can't keep anything for long-term. Whenever the memory is cleared of a given state, it's gone. So Coupling is not a bad thing at all. We have to understand that there are bad couplings, but there are also absolutely necessary couplings. So I suggest taking this perspective. Decoupling itself, completely decoupling, is bad. Coupling for the win. Uh, we should really be able to reason about the kind of coupling that we're producing, produce 
weak coupling when possible and when it's absolutely necessary strong coupling is for the win. So to wrap up I wanted to make sure that you know about this book that's now available Balancing Coupling in Software Design. The subtitle is Universal Design Principles for Architecting Modular Software Systems. This is by Vladik Konopnov, who is an author in my signature series. And you can find title here at informit.com. And I suggest that you look into this book. It covers much more than I possibly could in this tutorial. And hopefully you've gained a good understanding of the reasons for coupling and the dangers of uh, not designing good coupling. But you're going to find an entire new model to coupling in Vladek's book. Again, this tutorial is brought to you by my company, Kalele. You can find out more about the IDDD workshop at kalele.io slash IDDD workshop. This has not only my current workshops, but any upcoming workshops that I have and any that we're sponsoring by other trainers. I hope that you've enjoyed this and that you've benefited. We'll see you next time.